Um, with this, we are going to be looking at uh, really kind of the Silk Roads um, with this. Uh, it's going to be a huge topic within our uh, portion of things here. Um, in in the year twenty or twenty thirteen, eh? um, in twenty thirteen, there is a uh, Chinese president Xi Jinping who announces this massive kind of uh, expensive project eh? that becomes known as the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, it's intended to kind of connect the economies of Asia, Africa, and Europe, and it's dubbed the 21st century Silk Road. And it kind of evokes an ancient commercial network uh, all throughout Eurasia, which again, we understand is Europe and Asia. Um, so when we look at this, the memory is very useful to the reminder that various peoples, societies, and civilizations that we described in the previous chapters were never really wholly self-contained. <clears throat> there was always this importance of a relationship amongst different, different people, generally relying on commerce. Um, so even if you were a simple pastoral community or if you were a very small community of people, there was always some type of interaction um, and connection with a different group. Um, and so that becomes a huge part of this. Uh, you also start to see things like the specialization of jobs that begin to form out of this as well. When you see that uh, groups of people were uh, really a part of this, um, these ideals, and as soon as agriculture uh, becomes a bigger, plays a bigger role, we start to see the role changing a little bit amongst those different groups. So the most famous uh, networks of exchange, it's very widely known, it's the Silk Roads uh, that existed, uh, named after the most famous product that they transferred. Um, the Silk Road is gonna lead, link various peoples and civilizations from uh, Europe to Asia across this giant landmass, all right, from China all the way to Europe by the early centuries uh, during the Common Era. Um, it's very prosperous during the uh, political and uh, stable times as well. You have a vast array of goods that travel throughout the, uh, the Silk Roads. You, they use things like camel caravans to carry an array of goods across uh, across um, Europe and Asia, and, and really kind of that uh, that extending area. Um, camel caravans would stop at Caravanserai, okay, and rest. They'd exchange goods there. They would resupply. They'd have those abilities throughout this. Um, and such places, okay, kind of become major Central Asian com commercial cities. Places like. Um, Bukhara, Samakar, Samakarand, uh, Kashgar, those areas there become these rather large um, uh, cities later on in, 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 in the history that they have. So the making of the Silk Roads. Um, the one thing about the Silk Roads is while it is a trading network, most of the goods that make their way across the Eurasian network of exchange are luxury products. And usually they are going to be featuring things like uh, the elite and wealthy market rather than goods for just regular day commodities. That's kind of the way that, that we, we look at these different things. Um, silk is gonna obviously be the most important and most prominent one along those lines. Yeah. But that is the biggest portion of things. All right. So um, in Central Asia, silk was used as a currency and is also a, a symbol of a very high status. So silk is obviously one of those ones that becomes the st status symbol throughout the land and also within religion, throughout religion as well. Um, you have people who are going to be producing large amounts of silk 
uh, as in, in, in accompanying that. You have technological innovations that become a very important and effective within the overland silk route areas. Things like um, uh, stirrups made for the uh, use of camels, horses, and oxen uh, that are, are going to be one of those things. You have uh, a frame mattress saddle that allows camel to carry, uh, camels to carry heavier loads in a more stable fashion. New forms of credit become a big part of this as well. And paper money, which was initially a Chinese invention, uh, they called it flying cash because it was very easy to blow away in the wind, but it makes coinage unnecessary and coinage can be at that point in time very heavy. So those types of things carrying cash, like we commonly see today, although it's becoming less and less common, more people are just using cards, are a big part of this. And then also bills of exchange are being used quite a bit. Um, that's kind of a contract promising payment, almost like the use of a credit card now. Um, trade on the Silk Roads is going to be rather modest as well, but it will impact many um, of those uh, of the groups. Compared to the global commerce that we see today, the Silk Roads is not even uh, going to be able to carry as much of that as, as they do now. Um, but it prospers when uh, large states kind of offer security okay, uh, for, these, uh, for these groups. So you start to see conditions prevailing when Roman and Chinese emperors anchor kind of long distance uh, commerce at the Western and Eastern ends of Eurasia. Because there is a little more safety along the roads, they are uh, going much better. So again, as I was saying, guys, prospering uh, when large states offer security for the merchants and the travelers across long distances. So religion in the Silk Road. Buddhism, we know, spreads widely because of, excuse me, the Indian traders. Um, it's a product of the Indian civilization, but it spreads all throughout Central Asia, and it's because of the Silk Roads that do it. Um, there it takes root uh, throughout the oasis of the Central Asian uh, areas. Um, conversion to Buddhism in those places is completely voluntary. Uh, it's without the pressure of conquest or foreign rule, um, generally dependent on long distance trade, but it becomes a big part of this. Uh, as Buddhism goes across the Silk Roads, it'll spread from India to places like Central Asia, China, and beyond even that we'll start to see promoting a level of material ideals as well. Although Buddhism preaches this idea of kind of um, a modest style of living, as the Silk Roads go about it, uh, you start to see Buddhism promoting material ideals in the rich oasis town. So you'll see parties being held. You'll have musicians and ac acrobats that suggest kind of a newer, wealthier and more worldly style of things. Um, the religious practice changes as well. Mahayana form of Buddhism flourishes throughout the Silk Roads, um, the, the featuring the idea that the Buddha was a deity uh, who was very numerous and emphasis on compassion in, in those areas. That flourishes on the Silk Roads more so than the Theravada Buddhism, which some people say is more the ideals. They also pick up... Uh, um, they also do a, uh, a more of a, uh, uh, pick up other elements of things as well. So we know that they, they pick up, uh, Zor Zoroastrian fire rituals, um, and other forms of religion, uh, such as that. All right. And Buddhism will initially enter China via the Silk Road, and it becomes very widely accepted right around the eighth century in some parts of China it's looked down upon. There is persecution of it. The growth of Buddhism is not always accepted okay, by groups. Han Yu, who was a leading figure in the Confucian network, counterattacks on Buddhism. And he says this, now the, Buddha, now the Buddha was of barbarian origin. His language differed from Chinese speech. His clothes were different, were of a different cut. His mouth did not pronounce the prescribed words of former kings. He did not recognize the relationship between prince and subject, nor the sentiments of father and son. 
So we see how burst, uh, it becomes persecuted against quite a bit um, it, within China. A lot of times you would have 200, uh, at one point between 800, 1841 and 18, 841 and 845, excuse me, uh, 260,000 monks and nuns return to a normal life as tax paying citizens um, because they are not going to be allowed to uh, have their monasteries uh, uh, anymore. Um, one thing that we do see within this is despite that persecution, Buddhism does not vanish from China. It becomes a very dominant portion during the Song Dynasty. It's actually favored by the court officials. Uh, at the elite level of culture, you have Buddhist philosophical ideals playing a role kind of in the uh, reform, reformation, reformulation, excuse me, of Confucian thinking. This idea called Neo-Confucianism, all right? They do reject the Buddhist ideals, but like the high moral standards of teachings. And Buddhism, just like Taoism, will be an important uh, sort of Chinese cultural thing. So when we look at it, we see Confucian, Confucianism is definitely we woven into the Chinese uh, ideals. But we also see things like um, Taoism and Buddhism that become a big part of this as well. So those are some of the cultural ideas that are a part of it. China is assimilating Buddhism, um, into the, but their own cultural ideals will be expanding to nearby societies. We've talked a little bit about this, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, kind of all taking things from neighboring China. Uh, within Korea, they look at uh, court life and administrative techniques that they're looking to kind of replicate at, back at home. They also pay a tribute to uh, China as well. So too does Vietnam in some ways. And Japan really looks to bring in uh, kind of the schools of Chinese Buddhism that take root in their ideals. Uh, Neo-Confucian teachings also arrive in Japan around 1240 um, and prove very uh, influential amongst the high, highly recognized citizens. So uh, the sea roads, okay? The Silk Roads link Eurasian societies by land the sea-based trade routes connect distant peoples across the Indian Ocean basin. Um, this grows kind of out of, a, out of an environmental and cultural design. Um, the sea roads are, are going to be uh, more prosperous uh, in terms of not necessarily the luxury goods, but they carry things like spices, porcelain, cotton goods, pepper, um, ivory, all provided by the Indian Ocean trade. Things that they can carry here, transportation costs too are very much a lower cost on the sea roads because ships could actually accommodate heavier and larger cargoes. And the transportation of it is much easier as well. Eventually they'll carry more bulk goods than the Silk Roads, which would carry the luxury goods. So you start to see spices being carried via sea whereas the Silk Roads themselves will be carried um, across overland with luxury goods like the silk itself. Um, the monsoons okay, that exist within the Indian Ocean make commerce very much possible. Uh, they have very predictable winds in the summer uh, and winter months, which allow that, that trade to kind of persist. Uh, you have groups, the Chinese, the Malays, the Indians, Arabs, Persians, Swahilis, other groups that are going to perfect those practices as well. And we'll see improvements within uh, the sales. We'll see new types of ships, the Chinese Yunks and the Indian Arab Jows. Uh, new means of calculating things like latitude and longitude um, with the astrolabe, the magnetic needle or compass um, are all going to be improvements for Indian Ocean trade. And so this massive outflow of Chinese products that, exi uh, that exists will enter into uh, circuitous circuits of the Indian Ocean as well. Um, also facilitating the Indian Ocean uh, commerce is the permanent settlements that exist uh, on, uh, now on land. So generally we start to see the connection of um, things like uh, uh, 
ports, seaports, and they don't go away. They, they stay there and it allows for those groups to uh, push themselves in there. Any 